the heck is EOS? <laughs> Some of you might be asking this question. Some of you will actually already know because you're already on the journey. And what I hope to do over the day today is to start to deep dive a little bit further into what EOS is. Now, there's not much I can actually teach you in terms of the tools because they are very simple tools. But what I want to do is to supplement it with examples and things and actually help you to understand how you can implement it into your business. I want to also introduce you, you'll know her of course, but Kerry Bolton is here. Kerry is our other professional EOS implementer who's in the Business Blueprint community. So, thank you. <laughs> and Kerry's going to be helping me out because one of the key things that we want to do is we want to give you some real life examples about what this is about and show you how you can actually use it in your business. So, I'm going to start to give me a bit of a chance to settle down. I'm going to get you all to stand up if you don't mind and I'm going to ask you to engage with me. So there are a series of common frustrations that every business owner goes through. And I'm going to put them up on the board. And if you have ever experienced one of these frustrations, then please just sit down. So the first one is about control. Um, as entrepreneurs, we tend to be very control freakish. Um, and sometimes we feel like we have complete lack of control in our business. So has anybody in the room ever felt like they've had a lack of control in their business? I think I could sit down right now, but I probably have to stay standing. <laughs> the next one is around profit, not having enough profit in your business. Yep. <laughs> people, you know, we've, I love people. People are the most amazing things, but people can be a real struggle in the business sometimes, can't they? If you don't have the right people doing the right things, you can find people very frustrating. Anybody had any issues with people in their business? What about hitting the ceiling, where you're kind of, you know, going on great guns and the business is really, really taking off, and then all of a sudden, you just get completely stuck, and you don't know why you've got stuck. We call that hitting the ceiling. Anybody hitting the ceiling? Great. I don't know if we've got anybody else left standing, have we? <laughs> and the last one is nothing's working. You know, you're in this business, you're giving your absolute all, doing everything possible, but absolutely nothing is working. And I was going to say, if there's anybody left standing, I might just retire right now and let them run the show, but it looks good to see that we all have the same common frustrations. And you'll see as I take you through EOS, what this does is it actually helps you to work on those frustrations and bring everybody on the same page so that you can actually overcome them and move forward. So I'm going to be talking very much about EOS and the EOS life. So it's not just about EOS today. EOS is the system, it's the tools, it's the framework. But as EOS implementers, our whole role is to have you living your ideal entrepreneur, entrepreneurial life. And what we mean by that is doing what you love, so the stuff that really makes your heart sing, with people you love. So you love, look forward to going to work every single day. Making a huge difference in the world. The people we generally work with, they have a, a desire to leave the world in a better place. Being compensated appropriately, which means that you know, we're not earning, I think I read somewhere, some of business owners earn two or $3 an hour. We want you to be earning what you're absolutely worth in your business. And finally, with time to pursue other passions. Because I don't know about anybody else, is there anybody in this room who could literally work 24 seven because they love their business? <laughs> Yeah, I'm a bit guilty of that. I've got my husband actually here with me. He's sitting up on the top there taking some photos and things. But often I will be at work and it'll be seven o'clock in the evening and I'll get a message and he'll go, hey, darling. He's like, yeah, hi, Steve. Are you coming home tonight? Oh, yeah, why, what time is it? Oh, it's seven o'clock. Ah, right, okay, I'll be home soon. So I tend to get a little bit obsessed with my work. Um, but the whole point of implementing EOS into your business is making sure you do have time to pursue other passions. And we're very, very fortunate. Steve and I have just got back from a two-week camper van trip around the South Island in New Zealand with our two puppies. Um, and we were literally able to turn off all technology and just go and enjoy the time. So that is what the EOS life is all about. So what is EOS? I think Dale did a very good job of explaining it, but I want to just give you my perception of it and, and how we talk about it. So it is an entrepreneurial operating system that's actually about harnessing your people's energy and making sure they're all going in the same direction. And the way that I like to think of it, particularly in the business blueprint environment, is that it is the baseline operating system. So like on your Apple phone or your Samsung phone, you've got a real basic baseline operating system and then you plug things in. And the reason why I think EOS works so well with the business blueprint stuff is this gives you your operating system, your baseline tools that you use, and everything else that you learn within the business blueprint is the apps you plug in to make it work even better. And so we're going to talk about how we actually harness those people's energy and um, using these simple tools and processes. 
And I forgot to say hello to people online. Hello, people online. I can't see you, but I want to say hello and, and, and welcome you as well. Okay, statistics. Um, just, this is just to let you know that I'm not making this shit up, right? <laughs> We've been doing this for quite some time. So EOS was actually developed uh, many, many years ago. There's about 150,000 companies using these EOS tools worldwide. We've done 570 plus accredited EOS implementers. So when I say accredited EOS implementers, that is Kerry, myself, there are 570 other versions of us around the world, all around the world, who have trained, who have dedicated their life to actually helping others to implement this system. And we've done 110,000 plus session days delivered. So what do I want to do from today? I want to make sure that we have the following outcomes. I want you to get really, really real about your business. And there is a guy, and I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name properly, I think his name is Kurt Cadell. He was an Einstein contemporary. And he basically said that if you are working in your business, you cannot actually improve it. You have to get out of working in the business, start working on the business. So my desperate plea for you today is to try and lift yourself above the business, look at it from a panoptic point of view, a helicopter point of view, whatever you want to call it, but make sure that you're actually looking at it and being real about it. So we're going to start um, by doing a questionnaire, and I really want you to think about, it's not just about how you view the business, but how does your entire staff view the business? I want to make sure that we keep it really simple. Um, I am very much all about simplicity. I will apologize if I use acronyms. We've got a few acronyms in EOS. But in general terms, despite um, you know, being, having an MBA and being degree qualified, I don't like all the stuff that comes that makes it complicated. I like to keep things really, really simple. So we'll try to do that. Get results. I want you to actually leave here knowing how you can get better results in your business. And to do that, I want you to leave with a plan as well. So if we can look at um, the workbook you've got in front of you, you should all have a copy of this sitting on your desk. And if you don't, please grab one from somewhere. And for those online, I believe there's a link to this as well. So if you get a chance, print it out. We'll be writing in this. Um, it will actually help you to leave with a plan you can start to implement into the business. Okay. I know that Dale has introduced me, but I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an overview about who I am, just in case you're wondering. And those who came for the last one will have seen this before. But I'm an Air Force baby. My father was in the Royal Air Force, and so we traveled a lot. I grew up in Cyprus, then grew up in Britain, uh, spent most of my um, life up to 19 in Britain. Then I moved to Australia. I'm an Australian citizen. I got the Akubra hat and the dry as a bone and my little tree when I got my citizenship. And now I'm actually a Kiwi as well. I've got my Kiwi um, citizenship as well. Um, I'm a biochemist, like I said, I studied biochemistry here and food technology. Um, I was a sales rep in my first job out of school, and I'm a marketer, and I've done my MBA program, and I have run businesses most of my life. So I've been running businesses since I was 25 years old in senior leadership type roles, mostly for other people up until the last 15 years when I went out on my own. I actually had my first business when I was 13 years old. So running a business is in my blood. But sadly, my father and mother were not big business people. And so they suggested I should go and get a degree in science because it would help me to find a good husband. And so I'm now a biochemist. Sadly, the first two husbands didn't work out, but the third one who is here is awesome, so maybe it worked out at the end. <laughs> I'm an awarded business owner and also a twice business failure. So I was actually a finalist for the New Zealand Business Woman of the Year, um, but I've also had two business failures. So I actually know what it's like to have all the toys, all the accolades, the fast cars, the beautiful home, the holidays. I also know what it's like to worry about paying the wages bill, the tax bill, the GST every month. So I've been on both sides of that. I'm an adventurer and fun lover. Most people would think going into a camper van for two weeks around the South Island without any technology would be awful. But we had a brilliant time. And it was just so nice to get out there. And we love adventures. We've had a few more adventures than we were hoping for this time around. But, you know, life is like that. I'm a wife and a fur baby mother, so I never had children, but I have my little fur babies. And if we were actually doing this in New Zealand, they'd be up here on stage with me. They often come and do presentations with me. And of course, I'm a professional EOS implementer, and what that means is that we actually have been trained in terms of how to implement EOS. And finally, I'm still a business owner. So to this day, I run businesses as well on the side of um, doing professional EOS implementation. So that's all I want to tell you about me, just so you know who you are dealing with up here. And now I'm going to really hope that I can move forward. Yeah, perfect. OK. So why do I exist? My core purpose is I'm really, really passionate about helping entrepreneurs live their ideal lives. And this actually came from the fact that uh, when I had one of my businesses about three or four years, must be four or five years ago now, um, in the time of setting up a brand new business, I actually lost my brother, who was 44 years old. 
And uh, at the time, I was working really, really long hours. I was loving what I was doing, but I was finding it very, very stressful. And it kind of made me realize that actually, life is too short. You know, 44 years old and he was gone. 10 months later, my mother passed away. Um, and it was like another reminder that, come on, this is not the way we should live our lives. So now my whole uh, reason for being is to make sure that people can live their ideal life so they do have that time to pursue other passions. So they are doing what they love with people they love. Mm -hmm. And that's really the reason why I was so grateful to be invited to come and speak at Business Blueprint because I want to share with you some of the lessons I've learned but also from the clients that I've worked with as well to make sure we can actually help you get to the ideal entrepreneurial life. So one of my favorite quotes is um, from Jim Collins, because we actually use the Good to Great book a lot in EOS. And he says that magic, magic occurs when you combine a spirit of entrepreneurialism with a culture of discipline. And this is why I fell in love with EOS. So EOS actually used my event center in Auckland to launch into New Zealand. And when they came along, I went and I read the books. And I went, oh my goodness, this is everything that I've done in running businesses and in my MBA program and all of the books that I have read all brought down into a really nice, simple structure that anybody can implement. And as entrepreneurs, anybody here get distracted by bright, shiny objects, new things? <laughs> yeah. I can completely relate, and what I loved about this was that um, I, I also trained in Scaling Up as well, and Scaling Up is like a, the most amazing book. The Rockefeller Habits, second to none. But they're so complicated, and what I found in trying to implement that myself was that it was just too much for me, because I can't focus for that long. I'll be lucky to get through the whole day and not be distracted by things. So, you know, how on earth can you actually implant your business? So EOS brings this culture of discipline through a very, very simple set of tools, and they really are simple. This is a really scary thing. Sometimes you feel like it's too simple and you want to add to it and you want to do more things. Please don't. If you can just get these basics right, I promise it'll make a difference to your business. So what does magic look like? Um, it's a complete set of, of simple concepts and tools. And what it will basically do is it will help your team get better at three key things. So the first one is around vision. We want to make sure that every single person in your organization knows where we are headed, why we are headed there, what we're trying to do, uh, and the plan to get there as well. And I have no doubt you all have very, very strong visions. But in my experience, when I work with clients, you've got the vision in your head. You're not so good at clearly articulating it to your, to your staff. And this applies, like Dale said, to small businesses and large businesses. In my business, only three of us are actually in the business. We've got a VA over in the Philippines, I've got Jen, my assistant, and myself. And yet we run EOS in that business like any other business does. So it is really important that we get that stuff out of our heads onto a paper. And a good portion of today will be around how we do that. We've got to get, make sure we've got traction. So that is instilling focus, discipline, and accountability throughout the company so everyone executes on that plan every single day. And what I mean by that is running effective meetings, having a really good meeting pulse, making sure everybody knows what their number is, what the magic number is they have, are responsible for. And then finally, we have healthy. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to my team a bit later on. But we want to make sure that our leaders become a really cohesive, functional team that actually knows how to fun as well. Because life is too short to not be doing what we love with people we love. And so we want to make sure that we actually have that ability to have the difficult conversations in a fun environment. So, the way today is going to run, my first session up until morning tea is just an overview of EOS. I want to remind you, refresh you about the main tools we use in EOS. And even though you may have heard it before, there is a guy who worked with um, families, and I can't remember what his name is either, I'm forgetting all these names today, but he basically said that you have to repeat something a certain number of times before somebody hears it for the first time. Anybody know what that number is? So seven, according to this study, but speaking with Kerry this morning, the latest research actually says 11. So we've got seven to 11 times before you actually hear it for the first time. So even though you may have heard it before, I'm going to not just be a pure teacher. I'm going to intersperse it with ideas, with um, some examples from my own clients, so that you hopefully can see, get some context of how it works. The second part of the day, we're actually going to do some workshop stuff at your tables. So we're actually going to work through and start working through the, the VTO that um, Dale talked about, the Vision Traction Organizer. That is what we will end up leaving with, which is literally a two-page plan, where on the first page you have the vision, and the second page you have the traction or the plan to achieve it. And by the time we leave here, I want you to have that really, really clear in your minds by using the power of the group that we have here. 
And then finally, I'm actually going to give you a little bit extra than what we normally do in EOS, which is there is a great book that Gina has just written, or a little while ago written, called The EOS Life. And that is actually how do you make sure the business, when it's all sorted, will kind of run itself, but how do you make sure you manage your own energy? So EOS is about managing the energy of the whole company, but how do you as an entrepreneur make sure you manage and maximize your own energy? So we're working through some stuff there as well. There'll be a second workbook coming out after lunch. So that's what we're going to do. But before we get started, I would love for you to turn to page three and four in your workbooks. And on there, you will find the organizational checkup. And there are 20 questions there that I would love for you to really honestly answer about where your business is at right now. And if you think about it, what I would like you to do is, again, try to remove it from what you think is going on, but actually be really honest. So as an example, one of the questions is, we have a clear vision in writing that's been properly communicated and shared by everyone in the company. So if you are answering that question, number one, where one is um, weak and five is strong, if I went and asked your receptionist or your toilet cleaner or the guy who polishes the nuts and bolts out in the workshop space what the company vision is and how they fit into it, the only way I would get a five is that person actually said, yes, I know exactly what it is, I know how I fit into it. So I'm going to give you a few minutes just to answer those 20 questions if you don't mind and just do it as real as possible based on your entire organisation. Now, once you've finished it, you can total it up and it will actually give you a bit of an understanding about um, where you are at. But the actual real reason for me asking you to do that organisational checkup was to actually get you to start thinking about working on the business right from the start of today. Because now, by having gone through that, you'll have some ideas around where there is some room for improvement, where you might be good but would love to be great, and how we can actually do that. So that will be in the back of your mind now as we start to work through the day and start to implement the tools. So it looks like most of us are pretty much ready. Um, I will start to move on. Now, I'm going to start to use this little flip chart here. And uh, you'll see a little bit later on in my session room, I actually have a 3.3 meter whiteboard. So this one feels kind of tiny to me. I'm not quite sure I'm going to go drawing on it, but I'm going to do my best shot. I just feel like I, I, PowerPoint's wonderful, but I actually really enjoy drawing what I'm talking about. So I'm going to use the PowerPoint, but also draw on here. So we're going to do a quick overview of the EOS model and how it actually works. And basically, we're going to draw the EOS model up here. So what Gino Wickman discovered was that every single business experiences the exact same 136 issues. And if you can work to overcome those issues by strengthening these six key components, you will improve your business. So the EOS model always starts with your business in the center of it. And there are six key areas that we focus on. If we can actually increase and strengthen these six key areas, in general, it adds around about 40% to the bottom line of the business. So the first one, as you will see, is very much around vision. And in each of these six key components, we've got what we call the foundational tools. And there are two things that we have for each of these components. So I'll come back to that in a moment. The second part is, so vision, as we said, is around making sure everyone's on the same page. They know why they exist. They know what they're doing in the organisation. They've got a very clear understanding about where we're actually headed. And we're going to do a lot more work on this this afternoon. So we will skim through that a little bit in the first session. But that's what vision is all about. The second one is around people. And like I said in the beginning, if you get the right people doing the right things, your business is fantastic. But you get one person who's not doing the right thing or who doesn't um, follow your core values, and they can be the rotten apple in the business that actually destroys the business. So we're going to talk about how do we make sure we've got the right people in the business. The next one is around data. Um, and data is about just making sure that we're actually looking at the right thing. So I found, I, I spent a number of years working in corporate life before I went out into my own businesses, and often we would measure things just because we always have. Or we'd measure things that makes us feel good. Wasn't well, it wonderful we've got that many Facebook likes? Really? Does it matter? Does it actually make a difference to the business? So having the right data is very much about making sure we're measuring the things that will make a fundamental difference to the business. The next thing is around issues. And issues are 
<laughs> we know they exist. Everybody has them, 136 of them to be so precise. But what tends to happen is, as business owners, as leadership teams, we don't tend to highlight these issues. We don't tend to do very much with them. Or, or best case scenario, we highlight them, we discuss them a lot, but we do nothing about actually solving them. So we've got two tools that will actually help you to resolve issues at their root cause, and if you do that, that strengthens the entire business. Next one is around process, and there is a new book just been released by EOS, which is all around process, and process is very much about ensuring that it's our core processes are absolutely documented and people know how to follow those core processes. And finally, the first book that Gino ever wrote is around traction, and this is making sure, like I said, people know how they fit in to the business plan, what they're responsible for, and having meetings and things to actually keep them on track. So... See how good my drawing actually ends up being. There you go. That is the EOS model. It's not quite on the screen yet, but it's there. There you go. So we're going to talk about these six key components, a very high level to start off with. I'm not going to go into too much on the vision side because we're going to do some workshops, but stuff around that this afternoon. But we're going to start with um, what it looks like. So Gina always says, vision without traction is hallucination. We all have a clear understanding of where we want to go and what we want to do, but if we cannot clearly articulate it, if we can't get all our people on the same page and pushing in the same direction, rowing in the same direction, um, then you're not going to get there. So, the first part that we have to look at is how do we actually make sure we have got that vision sorted. I'm not going to go through these slides. So, we have this thing called the eight questions. And this is in your workbook. It looks like this. It is the vision traction organizer. It's the thing that I have showed you. We actually print this out every single quarter and laminate it and use it in our business. And the eight questions is what we're going to cover off in the workshop. But it's really things around, you know, what are our core values? What do we, um, how do we operate around here? What's our core focus? Why do we exist? And what do we do? What's our 10-year target? What's a big, hairy, audacious goal, as Jim Collins would say? Um, what is our marketing strategy? Who are we actually targeting and why? Why would they come to us? The three-year picture, what does it look like in three years' time? How do we actually make sure we know where we're headed? And then we have the second page, which is around the traction part of it, which is about how do we bring that down to the ground? So once we've got that great idea of where we're headed, how do we actually bring that down to the ground? So don't worry too much about this right now, because we're going to go through this in great detail later on. I'm going to run like little mini sessions with you, like I would do with a client um, in the next couple of sessions. But once we've got that, the most important thing is we have to make sure it's shared by all. And that it can be a number of different things. So first of all, we have to have it actually written out, somewhere that people can understand it, they know what it means, they know how they fit into it, but then we have to make sure we are repeating it over and over again. How many times do we have to hear something before we hear it for the first time? <laughs> yeah, 11 is the new figure. So this is really hard for us as entrepreneurs because we tend to think, I've already told you this. And so with my teams, I say, look, don't worry. If, how many times have you told them? Well, I told them in the beginning and we had a meeting another week. Great, so that's twice. Just another five to however many more to go. <laughs> and we have to kind of bite our tongue and just go, we have to keep repeating this. If people don't see this regularly, they will never actually get it. So part of the shared by all is to make sure that we actually have... Yes, the physical manifestation of what we want to achieve, but everybody understands how they actually fit into that plan. And we'll do a lot more work around that this afternoon. The 100% strong looks like, you know, everybody knows exactly where we're headed, what we're doing, why we exist, what our 10-year target is, and they are actually executing on every single day. The people part comes down to two parts. And we talk, first of all, about having the right people. And when we say the right people, these are the people who absolutely share your core values. And again, we're going to do a little bit of work around this when we go into our core values, but it's really important that people in our teams, even if they're really good at what they do, they have to actually share our core values and live by our core values. And we have to live it, we have to breathe it, we have to hire and fire based on it. We need to make sure that those people actually meet that. The second part... This is a pet case, so people understand. So the way that we do this um, is we, once we've actually established our core values, which we'll do later on today, we literally set up this thing called the People Analyzer. It's a really, really cool tool. It seems really simple. People go, this cannot be all of it, but it absolutely is. So the People Analyzer literally means that we put up a chart, and let's just say we've got five core values. We're going to use the EOS core values as an example here. So humbly confident, grow or die, help first, do the right thing, do what you say. And we write our established core values across there, which we have actually discovered by looking at our best people. 
And once we discover them, we then put the people's names in here. We've got, we've got Melissa, we've got David, and we've got Anna. And in this people analyzer, what we then do is we go through, first as leaders, and go, in my team, what does my team look like? So I've got Melissa in my team. Do we think Melissa is humbly confident? And we've defined what these values mean and how we actually expect people to, to behave based on them. And we then give them either a plus, a minus, or a plus minus. And the plus is very much means that most of the time, this person actually shows this core value. Now, we're human beings, right? So things happen. We can't always be 100% perfect. But if most of the time, Melissa is humbly confident, she deserves a plus in that people analyzer. We then have a minus. And a minus means that most of the time, that person does not exhibit that value. So David, God love him, um, he is not humbly confident most of the time. Might be a bit arrogant, doesn't really sort of, you know, doesn't fit the core values. So he would get a minus. And then we've got somebody who might get a plus minus. And plus minus really means that they flip-flop. You don't know which day of the week it is. If you go in on a Monday, they're beautifully humbly confident. By Friday, they're arrogant. So they're really not sort of sticking to one or the other. The great thing about a plus minus is you can work on it. If somebody is not actually living by the core value most of the time, you can start as a leader to say, how can I help you with that? What's going on? What are the things that are happening in your life that potentially could affect this? And what can I do to help you to get back to a, po a positive? If they're a minus, like David is as an example, it's highly unlikely they will ever change. It is not part of their core value. It's not how they operate. And so this gives us a real red flag that this person may not be the right person. And we go through and we do this with all of the different values until we get to a point where we go, right, we know what this person looks like. And then we decide as a team, what is the bar we're prepared to accept? So, you know, for most of us, we might say, hey, we've got five core values. We probably accept one plus minus because every once in a while, somebody may not be living by the core value. Something's going on for them. But anything less than that, we don't accept that around here. And once we have that bar, we then have to look at it and go, okay, so now if we look at this, we've got a couple of people issues there, right? Because the first people issue is David. I don't think there's any chance for him to come back from that. He's got three minuses and two, two plus minuses. He's probably not the right core values fit. Anna may have some things going on. So as a leader, I would actually, um, I'd first of all ask Anna to rate herself as well. But we then have a conversation and go, right, so I think that in these three areas, we've got plus minuses going on. What can we do to actually bring you back up to a plus? How can we help you? What's going on in your life? What training do you need? What support do you need? How can I actually make sure that you come back to being a plus across the board? With David, the conversation is going to be like, David, do you enjoy working here? That's my first question always. Do you enjoy working here? Any hesitation or pause, we've got a real problem. Um, and then once you start delving deep, you start to find out, you know, how do they feel about being in this organisation? Do they feel like they fit in? Tell me what's going on for you. And we hope these people will, through living by these core values, will actually self-select out of the business. And if not, we'll have some tough conversations about how we get rid of them. So that's the people analyzer. Um, because I use this all the time, it's sort of second nature to me. But does that make sense in terms of a way to look at your people to see if they actually are the right people? Yeah? Cool. So that is how we make sure we have the right people. The second thing is, we have to make sure that we actually have them in the right seats. And this is one of my favorite, favorite tools in EOS. And I'm going to tell you how we actually do it with our clients. So, we talk about having structure first and people second. And what we mean by this is, as an entrepreneurial business grows, we tend to grow organically. We often find that we don't define the accountabilities and the roles really strongly, and people just kind of fall into the business and start doing things. It could be a family member, it could be um, a friend, it could be whatever it might be, but it grows organically and we lose sight of what the structure really needs to be. So we might well have a, um, what are they called? The hierarchy charts, what are they called? An org chart, that's right. We might well have an org chart, which is very, very traditional. It says, hey, we've got a CEO, and then we've got a general manager, and then we've got these areas here. And all it does, it gives you a title and a name. And from that, nobody has any clue what anybody actually does. So we actually encourage our clients to go and look at their business and go, if we want to achieve our goals in six to 12 months, what is the structure we actually require to achieve those goals? And it's pretty much, um, in most businesses, there will be three main areas... In fact, in every business, there will be three main areas that they absolutely have to have. And sometimes this might go into more, but the accountability chart goes, hey, let's talk about the main functions of the business, and let's talk about what is required in that main function. So the first box is around sales and marketing. 
If you cannot sell stuff, you have not got a business. So every business must have a sales and marketing function. The next function is around operations. And again, if you can't deliver that stuff, then you haven't got a business. And then the third and final one is finance and admin, which if you don't bill for that stuff, you haven't got a business. And I use the example of my event center. So we were really, really good at sales and marketing. We got some amazing brands using the event center, some of the biggest brands in the world coming and using it. Sales and marketing, fantastic. Operationally, I think we did okay. We had some really great processes, good tick boxes, things were going pretty well. On the finance and admin side, we forgot to bill people. <laughs> when we finally wound up the business because of COVID, there was over $10,000 worth of bills that had never, ever been sent out because we weren't very good at the finance and admin part. So every business needs to have these three things as an absolute bare minimum. And sometimes there'll be more. So I've got a client, for example, who has a, a restaurant business that also manufactures food. So they've got two operations functions because they've got the restaurant side of the business, which is very unique, and then they've got the food manufacturing, more like a production um, side of things. So this can be more than three, but we have to have these three. What we then say is, right, what are sales and marketing actually accountable for? So we'll go through and we will give the five kind of main things that sales and marketing are accountable for. The sales and marketing plan, lead generation, profitability. Um, it could be around you know, number of visits to the website, whatever it might be. Whatever you think this person should be accountable for. You then do the same for the operations. You go, right, in order to deliver this product, what are the five kind of key areas in this function that need to be delivered upon? Great customer service, quality control, delivering on time and on budget. Um, making sure there's no errors, whatever it might be, the five main things, and similarly for finance and admin. And as we go through this, in this there might actually be, the if you've got any people who are part of this at the next layer down, for example, your first bullet point would actually be what we call LMA. And LMA is leadership, management, and accountability. So that covers all of the people processes we have to do to lead, manage, and hold them accountable. And then we'll have four other bullet points that actually um, specifies this job. Above all of this, we have got an, another role, which sometimes can be called a general manager, a COO. It's a person who kind of holds it all together. So we call this the integrator. And their role, they've got to lead, manage, and hold accountable the leadership team. But then they usually have things like um, they have the accountability for the business plan, making sure we're actually executing on a business plan. They have the overall accountability for profit and loss. They tend to look after special projects. They are there to kind of beat the drum, make sure everyone's on the same page, make sure they're all doing what is required to actually achieve that business plan. They run the level 10 meetings. They do all those things. And then in most businesses, we have a, another role. And, you know, it's, it's great to hear that Dale and his team are implementing EOS. Um, I think they might have one of these in their, in their leadership team. A visionary. Let me describe a typical visionary for you. Um, and you can decide if A, you actually relate to it yourself, or B, you have one in your organization. So the visionary's role is generally about having the big, crazy ideas. They have the big relationships. They wake up in the morning. They're thinking about loads of different things. And in their role in the business, they're the one that comes on a Monday morning to the meeting. They go, hey, guys, we're doing really, really well, but I had this fantastic idea while I was fishing on the weekend. Oh, really? What's that? Well, I think we should make stuffed elephants. I was like... Oh, okay, stuffed elephants, that's interesting. And before you know it, the whole team is running around going, okay, to make stuffed elephants, we need some fabric, we need some stuffing, we need to get some eyes, whatever else we need. And then this person will come in the next Monday morning and they'll go, what are you guys all doing? It's like, well, we're making stuffed elephants. Why are you doing that? Because you said you wanted to make stuffed elephants. Oh, no, I've moved on from that. Now I've got another idea. <laughs> So these are the people that they call crazy until everything works out, and then they are geniuses. And they have to be in a business that wants to grow, right? Because without that forward thinking, nothing will actually happen. The problem is they're a danger to the business as well. Because if they're not managed in the correct way, their energy can actually be really harmful rather than positive. So by giving them a box that they actually own, we can say, hey, you know what, Mr. Visionary, Mrs. Visionary, well, the things we really want you to do is the big ideas. We want you to have the big relationships. We want you to look at industry trends. We want to come up with brand new things you can actually do. But we're going to put this person in here that will just keep you a little bit away from the rest of the team. And their job, they've got the best job in the whole wide world, is to not squash the, the beautiful energy that, in, that visionaries bring to the organisation, but to actually enhance it and, and harness it and make sure by the time it actually gets to these people down here, 
It's a good idea. It's been tested. We know it's going to work. And to keep them away from the day-to-day -day running of the business. Because as a visionary, and I have to admit I have some visionary tendencies myself, um, we can be really, really damaging to the organisation. We will go in there, and of course, uh, we can do everything better than everybody else. So we want to tell everybody how they should be doing it. But I can do it this way, and, I wanna, and we will meddle with our fingers, and we'll end up upsetting the team. So by actually defining this role and going, this is what we need you to do, and you will come through the integrator before it gets to this part here, it gives the organisation a really strong plan for how to achieve it from a structural point of view. So, anybody think they might be a visionary in the room? <laughs> yeah, I thought there might be a few. Excellent. What I love about this, I was working with a client, and um, he was the visionary of a truck building company, and when we're talking about you know, the structure of the organisation, what should be done, he actually shared that what he really wanted to do was spend time running his family's dairy farm. And he wanted to come in and do the big picture stuff, just the ideas, visiting the trade shows every year and come through with the new things they want to do. By de defining this box for him, it meant he could actually do that. Because now everybody else knew what they were accountable for, what they had to do, and he could actually free himself up to just do the big picture stuff and go off and run his dairy farm. So, as a team, we do this as a team, right? It's not up to you as the visionary to go, I know what this should look like. I'm going to develop this all up and then present it as a fait accompli. Here you go, here's my accountability chart. Team, off you go and go and do it. We actually do this as a leadership team together in a room. And we sit there in the room, we go, hey, how do you think this business should be structured to deliver on what we have to deliver on? And this can take somewhere between three hours. I think the, the record is something like 10 hours. My longest was six hours. I worked with an advertising agency. We went round and round and round in circles because they couldn't get past the ego part of it. This is not about ego, right? It's about accountability. You may be accountable for sales and marketing. You might have a completely different title. Don't, don't really care what you call yourself as long as you actually deliver on those five key things. But within the advertising agency, everybody wants to be on the leadership team. I've always been on the leadership team. Yeah, so? You, but you don't understand. I've always been on the leadership team. Okay, that's really good. We've got five roles here. Which one do you want? None of them. Well, then you're not the leadership team. Well, but I've always been on the leadership team. Yeah, but again, as a team, we've decided this is the structure we need to actually achieve that. So which role do you want? None of them. Then you're not on the leadership team. <laughs> and so it's a real, you have to do it as a team. And the, we do structure first, people second. So the f first most important thing you do with your team is decide what is that structure. It doesn't have to be just five things. There could be five or seven along here, as long as the main functions of the organisation are covered. And once you've got that and you've got the five key accountabilities, then you start asking, have we got the right people for it? And this is where, as a team, you get to decide which role do you actually want. So let's just say I was working with you as a whole team here. We've got five roles there. I'd say, OK, who would like to do the sales and marketing team? That sales and marketing role. And someone would put their hand up, and I'd go, cool, let's have a look at that. So I want to know, do you actually GWC this role? Do you get it? Do you want it? And do you have the capacity to do it? Now, get it is deep in your gut. If you told me a sales and marketing role, I completely get that, right? It's been my life. I understand what's required. I completely get it. Want it means I actually want to jump out of bed in the morning and do this role. I'm super passionate about it. It's what I love to do. I don't want to do sales and marketing. So for me, I would not be a W in that particular role. Capacity to do it is not about time capacity because we all have the same amount of time. And there's some certain time management tools we use in EOS that can help you to maximize that time, but it isn't about time. Do you have the capacity, technical knowledge, expertise, and experience to do the job properly? Sales and marketing, I'd get a C without a doubt. Finance, hmm, maybe not so much. Um, I can do accounting, I can do finance. I, my first husband was an accountant, so I learned a lot from that. Um, but the reality is that it takes me twice as long to do it as an accountant would. I'm probably more likely to make mistakes because I don't really enjoy it. And so I'd have to say capacity to do it, I don't have a C on that role. So in your team, you might have two people put their hands up for sales and marketing. What we actually do is we go around the table to a real-time review and we go, right, we've got Kerry who wants to do it, we've got, I can't see people's names from up here, John over here and we've got Mary over here. All of you now get to score yourself and then we get to score you too. And we go around the table and we actually go, Kerry, you know what? 
I actually think you get it. I'm not sure you want it. And capacity, I've got a bit of an issue there. And we make sure that we don't just give people a negative feedback, but we give them a reason why. And the reason why I don't think you want to do it is I know you love exit planning, and that's where you want to be doing things. So I think you don't really want to do this role. Capacity to do it? I don't know, I just think that in reality, you probably haven't had the experience we're looking for. So we go around and every person who's put their hand up gets some real-time feedback from everybody else in the room. Until we get to a point where we actually agree who is the right person for that role. That is the stuff you don't get to read in the books that you can't see happening. That is the stuff that's really, really important. You could develop this, you could get it um, put together, you could decide who to put it in there, but if you don't go through that process, you don't bring the team along the journey. So I've had two teams where we had 11 people come into the focus day. And I would highly recommend you never bring 11 people to a room. Because the reality is, probably at most you might get eight people, maybe seven, more likely five on the leadership team. That means that six of those people are going to be leaving that room not particularly happy because they haven't got to on the leadership team. But by taking them through the process, they get to understand why they don't have a role on the leadership team. So what they see is that this is a structure that we require to build the organisation to achieve its goals. These are the roles that we have, and I don't fit those roles. Therefore, I'm not part of the leadership team. Now, I'm sure Kerry can also share this, but I mean, I've had people storm out of the room. I've had people cry. I've had people um, refuse to talk for the rest of the day. Um, so we have some, some strange reactions, but they go away and they think about it and they actually realise it's for the greater good. And because you've brought them on that journey, they understand why they don't have a role in the leadership team. And we always say to them, it's not America. You've still got a job. You've still got the same salary. You've still got the same title. It's not like you're going anywhere. You just don't have a role in the leadership team. Make sense? So that is the, the two parts of the people thing. And I, now all this stuff I just drew should be up here. So we always say, what is the main function of the business? What are the five key roles that person has to have? And it's only after we've done that we then go and put the name into there. And then what we have, so for example, marketing and sales, LMA, marketing, hit sales numbers, sell, account management. We check to make sure the person or people gets it, wants it, has capacity to do it, and then we put their name in there. And we do this, as I say, in real time with the team, with giving feedback. So in our particular example before, Melissa, David, and Anna, um, we go through and we go, do they get it? Do they want to have capacity? You then do this for every role within your organisation, every person in that role, to see if you actually have a person who gets it, one has capacity. So there's two types of people issues you can actually have, right? Because you have to have three, GW, three yeses for GWC. You cannot have somebody who doesn't get it. That will be an absolute disaster for the business. You can't have somebody who doesn't want it because that means they're not going to enjoy doing it, they're not going to take responsibility for it, it's not going to happen. And if they don't have the capacity to do it, they will stuff it up. $10,000 of unbilled invoices. So once we've got these, these seats, we then end up having a, a, a chart that looks like this across the whole organisation. The beauty of it is anybody in the organisation can see all of the accountabilities and the roles there. And they can say, if I want to talk to somebody about the website and website visits, oh, look, that's that function there. That's the person who's accountable. And when we get to scorecards, you'll see that they have um, scorecards related to what they're doing. So two kinds of people issues, right person, wrong seat. This is a tough one because these are your family that you love, that share the same core values, but they're not in the right seat. They don't GWC it. You've got to try and either find another role for them in the company that they do GWC, or you have to let them go. And this can be tough, because these can be people who have been there for a long, long time, who you absolutely love, they're part of your family, but if you do not get them into the right seat, they will have a detrimental effect on the business. And the second one is the wrong person in the right seat. <laughs> Typically, salespeople who tend to be high achievers, um, they might go out there and they'll do a great job in terms of selling, but if they don't share the core values and you're letting them get away with it, you're basically encouraging everybody else to not follow them either. So they are absolutely poisonous from a, a, a business perspective. Either way, these people have to either be moved into upside. The first one, try and find a role for them or let them go. Second one, let them go as soon as possible because they will have a detrimental effect. That's people. 100% strong means we've got that accountability chart completely um, 
what do we call it, drawn out for the next six to 12 months. What do we need to do to achieve in the next six to 12 months? I've got one client who's sadly not here today, but he's a Business Blueprint member. He and his team have gone five years ahead and actually plotted out what it will look like in five years' time. And they've got an entire accountability chart for five years. And what it means now is they can start thinking about what's the next role they have to fill. So in the accountability chart thing, one, one thing I forgot to mention is you can actually wear multiple hats. I could be the visionary and the sales and marketing person. That's absolutely fine, because in a small organisation, I probably have to do that. But what you cannot have is two people in the same accountability box. Because this is like when you send an email to six people, and you CC in six people, how many people actually action that email? None, or six. Not sure which is worse, because <laughs> six people are doing it and doing it differently, or zero people are doing it. So one person is accountable, that is it. You might wear multiple hats. So in his five-year vision, his five-year accountability chart, he can literally, he's got people wearing multiple hats, but he can very quickly see as the business starts to grow and they start to need more people, he can go, that's the next role we should be filling. So that's a really helpful tool. Okay, back to the model. Um, data. Data is, uh, consists of two things. We use a thing called uh, the scorecard, and we have, we have what we call measurables. And in terms of the scorecard, this is a very, very simple tool. I love this quote. If we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. And as a visionary who's quite strong, I have very strong opinions. So if we don't have data and scorecards, we just do what I want to do, not necessarily the best thing for the business. So we have to go, right, what do we, what's the data we have to look at? So the scorecard is actually a really, a really simple tool, which literally is a, a spreadsheet, a, a piece of software, doesn't matter, where you actually go through and you go, what are the key measurables we want to look at on a weekly basis? So every single week in our level 10 meeting, we review these measurables, and we're going to look at them, we're going to set a goal for them, but we're going to look at them on a 13-week rolling basis. So we know who looks after it, and then we're going to review it on a th every single week on a 13-week basis. So here you go. This is our scorecard. Where it is red, it means we haven't achieved it. Now, this is not about absolutes per se, but it's about recognising where we have trends. And it has to be a mixture of leading and lagging indicators. So you can have your lagging stuff, which is your revenue, it's, it's the things that have already happened. But what are the leading indicators? So on this one, it's things like sales calls, sales meetings, proposals sent out. They're the things that actually lead through to bringing business into, into the, um, sorry, bringing money into the business. And if you've got reds on those leading indicators, you know they'll eventually affect the lagging indicators. And I share this openly, because this is something that we actually do as EOS implementers. Uh, we have got what we call the 421 model. It is our funnel. And what it basically says is that for every four people that you have a VTH call, which is our initial call with, two of them will end up having a 90-minute meeting, and then one of them will pop out the bottom as a client. Now, I've gone further than that, and I also know if I send out 10 books, I generally get four calls. I get two 90-minute meetings and one client out of it. So on my scorecard, if I'm not hitting my 10 books in a month, if that's what I want, one new client a month, I'm not going to get one new client a month. So it's really important that we're looking at that. And one of the examples that I gave is that, um, who's been affected by COVID here in their business? So imagine running an event centre and a coaching business, a new coaching business in the middle of COVID. Not many people want to come to an event centre, and most people were not really keen to get together in coaching, particularly in New Zealand. We had really, really strict lockdown laws. And so as a consequence, it would have been easy for me to actually get rid of the scorecard and go, OK, I'm not going to look at it. It's too scary. We did it every single week. We had reds across the board. But what we did realise was if we kept going like that, nothing would ever change. So it forced us to face that reality and go, what do we need to do differently? And what we did realise are things we could actually affect were the leading indicators. People still read books when we're in a lockdown. People still want to get information on a lockdown. So we had to focus more on that, knowing it wouldn't necessarily lead to results immediately, but it gave us something to do. It also made us realise that we had to find other ways to get income. Because sadly, when you've got an event space and you've got um, a business and you've got staff to pay, you can't not pay them, you can't not pay the rent. So what else could we actually do? So these scorecards have to be things that are really meaningful, but where you can pick up trends and things as well and start to action them. So every department has a scorecard. 
Your leadership team that Dale talked about, your executive leadership team at the top of there, has got a scorecard that which is the high level stuff. Usually revenue, usually profitability, cash flow, definitely some of those sales kind of calls. Then each department has their scorecard as well. And so they've got a scorecard within marketing that goes on much deeper. High level, this number of clients, lower level, what else do they actually need to know in the marketing? And then, the, so each of those areas has it. Then the sub areas have them as well. And from that, everybody gets a measurable too. Because if you remember back to the scorecard, the scorecard had a, a number, um, a, a thing we were measuring, and somebody was accountable for it. And so if you get this right, every single person in the organisation has got a number they know they're accountable for. And they're measured on every single week in a level 10 meeting on their scorecard. For a receptionist, it might be picking up a phone within three rings. It might be answering an email within 24 hours. For a salesperson, it'd be a certain number of sales calls, certain number of proposals, all different things. I've got a lot of com companies that actually import products from overseas. They've got things like die fart, you know, are things being delivered on time, what's out of stock. They've got stock turnover. Um, in the food business, it's around how many meals they produce, how many orders they have. There's a whole range of things, but it's really important. These must not be vanity measurables. They've got to be things that actually help you to understand when something is going wrong so you can make a difference immediately. Okay, scorecard, measurables, done, tick, 100% strong. Every single person knows what, they've, what their scorecard is, what their measurables are, and they are looking at it every single week without fail, even in the tough times. Issues. <laughs> We've talked about issues briefly, but, you know, um, every company has issues. What we tend not to do is actually deal with those issues. And so the whole EOS model has a really, really simple tool that says, first of all, let's create an issues list. Let's have an issues list, both short-term and long-term, where we record every single thing that is going wrong with this business. Now, an issue could be also a positive as well. So don't think of it just being a negative. It could actually be a positive. An opportunity. There's an opportunity to go into this market. That becomes part of our issues list. And we have a short-term and long-term one. And what we do is we, we create these lists, and we use this tool called IDS. And when we IDS, it's called the Issues Solving Track, another acronym in EOS, we use these three things to, to solve issues. So the first thing is we identify the issue. And in my experience, we don't do this very well because we all want to jump in and provide solutions, right? Oh, look, we've got an issue here. Let's provide a solution. So when you identify an issue properly, you become the curious child. You ask lots of questions. Why? So why is that? Well, what about that? When did that start happening? What do you think is causing that? You're asking all the W questions to find out what the real issue is. And I had a classic example with one of my clients the other day who was a big importer. And they, I was observing a level 10 meeting, and they said, oh, we've got an issue with operations. I said, what do you mean? Operations capacity. Oh, OK. What do you mean by operations capacity? We haven't got enough people in operations to do the, the work. Oh, that's interesting. Why is that? Well, they just haven't got enough people to do the work. OK, so what's changed? Well, since COVID hit, we've got delays on shipments. When the shipments come in, we've got pre-orders, back orders, rah, rah, rah. I was like, oh, OK. So what did you use to before COVID? Well, the computer system handled it all. Oh, OK. Why doesn't the computer system handle it now? It doesn't have the ability to handle back orders and forward orders and whatever. I'm not, not my area of expertise, right? Um, and I thought, like, OK, that's interesting. So what if the computer system could actually do that? Would that be good? They were like, yeah. What would that look like? Oh, we'd have to do some development. Oh, what would that look like? And so we started discussing, you know, what were the... So the identification, though, if we had just gone with the initial thing, the easy solution would be to employ more people. Now, I know that your employment laws are the same over here as they are in New Zealand. You can't employ people and get rid of them quickly and easily. So that would be a really sort of silly mis um, mistake to make. So by actually really identifying what the issue was, we decided it was a software or process problem in actual fact. And we worked on um, discussing what the possible solutions were. And some of it was we could hire more people. We could do it temporarily, a contractor. We could update the software, make the software work for us. We could change the process, so the process actually works better. And we discuss it around the table with everybody contributing. Don't think because you're accountable for operations, you have to solve it. You're actually using the power of the greater good, the greater minds to actually solve that issue. And so once we've discussed it, we can then go, right, what is the best solution? Another really simple example I like to give here as well is I had a client who was in the education sector and they, um, one of their staff came from the staff level 10 meetings. She said, oh, look, um, I'm really upset because I don't have my name on a coat peg. 
Now, as a visionary, you kind of go, seriously? We've got more important things to worry about than that, but okay. I said, like, okay, well, that's interesting. So tell me, what, what, is, what does that mean for you? So what well, makes me feel like I'm not wanted here? Oh, why is that? Because everybody else has got their name on a coat peg. Oh, okay. Gosh, didn't realise it was that important. Okay, cool. Um, so the issue is you don't feel like you're actually part of the team and part of the team long term. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now we can discuss to solve it. There's more than one solution to that problem, right? What's the obvious solution? Put a name on a coat peg? Yep. What's the better solution? Take all the names off all the coat pegs. <laughs> because it didn't really matter where you hung your coat. <laughs> and that meant that actually you weren't creating ongoing issues for people thinking they're more important. I see this with the car parks, within car parking um, buildings as well, right? Um, I understand that maybe the CEO feels they should have a car park, but if they're not there all the time, you know, is there another way of actually doing it? So, identify it, spend lots of time asking those W questions. Why, when, how, who, there's an H in there as well. Um, discuss it, think about all the different possible solutions, and then solve it. But the most important thing, which I haven't even talked about, is what do you think, most, with an issues list, where do most people start? Top of the list, yeah? There's a top of the list issue there, website rock off track. We could spend our entire time identifying, discussing, and solving that, only to find out that a bigger issue was actually Andy S. in the right seat. He is actually our biggest challenge right at the moment. So when we do our issues, it's really important that rather than starting at the top, we actually go, what are the top three issues? And we discuss them in that order. And therefore, if we run out of time discussing issue number one, it's okay. It was the most important issue. But if we do start from the top and start on that website rock-off track, and that was a really minor issue, we're going to have some challenges there. Okay, that's um, issues. Issues, uh, ju just, just working through this in your level 10 meeting is going to make a huge difference to the way the business actually runs. And 100% strong means we're actually looking at all these issues, short-term and long-term, and solving them either in our weekly level 10 meetings or our quarterly meetings with our team. Process. Two things to process. First of all, we need to document our processes. So we call documented. And the second thing is followed by all. Now, documented does not mean having an SOP manual that is this big that nobody ever looks at or nobody bothers to follow. Uh, we tend, again, as humans, to want to overcomplicate everything and have everything 100% right. We talk about using the Pareto principle, where we literally say that we know that 20% of our processes will give us 80% of the results. So we're talking about core processes. What are the five to 13 core processes in your business that relate to the different areas of the business, HR, sales and marketing, operations, that need to be followed for us to actually get the most result? And there's some tools there that will just make it a lot simpler, but it's really about just making sure we're really clear about what they are. And here's an example. So we've got people, marketing, sales, operations, customer service, accounting, that's our business, right? When we document and simplify them, we just literally go through and go, right, here's a table of contents. These are our core processes. We document them in a very simple way. So as a people process, if we want to hire somebody, we identify the need, we define the seat, we look at hire, you know, what we do to hire them. We've got a process for onboarding and training, a process for leading, managing, and holding them accountable, and we've got a process for termination. That is it. And what we say is that we do that for every single part of the, the um, business when the leadership team has agreed on what that is. And we want to systemize the predictor so you can humanize the exceptional. And what that saying really means is if you can make it really, really simple and have the core processes actually documented and followed by all, then they can add a human element to it. We don't want people going, do you want fries with that? We want them to make sure that they know what they should be asking, but they can actually add their own personality to it as well. So that is what EOS talks about in terms of process. And the final thing I'm going to talk about before we go for our break is around how to, oh, sorry, making sure you're going to follow it by all. There's a few key things you have to do here. You've got to train people, first of all. Here's our core process. This is how we have to do it. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Then you want to measure it. You want to lead, manage, and hold accountable, and you want to update. And one of the things that kind of finally struck me after two and a half years of doing this, the reason we do this with the core processes, first of all, is because... A, they produce the most results, but B, they're not going to be right. They're going to have to change all the time. If we try and document everything, by the time we've documented everything, it's already moved and changed. So we need to actually focus on the core stuff first, get it up and running, and then we can start to do more after that has been done. 
Okay. Finally, traction. <laughs> um, there's two things that exist here in traction. We've got the rocks, we've got the meeting pulse. I'm going to come back to the meeting pulse later on today because that's really, really important. Um, but the rocks is really where everything starts. So the, there is a tendency, again, that we want to do a whole lot of things, right? We're very driven people, we're very motivated, we want to get a whole lot of stuff done. The idea behind rocks is what are the most important things that absolutely have to get done. How do we have that laser sharp focus for the next 90 days on what needs to be done? And everybody in your organisation needs to have those rocks to understand what needs to be done. So in the process we're going to work through in the next session, we're going to think about, you know, what are those rocks? What are the key things? And I was working with a client the other day who was working with another business coach before they came to me. And I said, oh, so what's your plan for the year? I said, we've got 43 objectives we want to achieve. And I went, huh? I was like, oh gosh, I mean, I'm pretty smart and I'm pretty onto it, but I couldn't do 43. It's taken me, we, do, we, we actually obviously live and breathe our own stuff. It has taken me two years to finally get to a place where I've done all my rocks for the quarter last quarter, and that's because I finally only got four. Because every other quarter, I was like, oh, I can do seven. Oh, I can definitely do that many. I can't. I can do four. That's the reality. So, um, you know, less is more. Weniger aber besser. It means that, you know, le um, less but better. We've got to make sure that we are absolutely laser sharp focused on what needs to be done. 